Hello, today we study curves from a totally different point of view. Before that, make sure you check out my previous videos on the question and study of curves in metric and Euclidean spaces. Already there has been at least nine videos on them. Okay, so, so far the curves for us have been continuous or Lipschitz functions from a compact interval in R1 into a metric or a Euclidean space. In this uh, video, we will fix on the notation capital gamma for the image of the curve which sits inside X. And sometimes we will uh, abuse the notation that uh, we call this subset also a curve. And that abuse of notation is pretty standard and uh, usually uh, not as confusing as it could be. Okay, what we know about this set just from gamma being continuous is that gamma is compact and it is connected. Uh, basic exercises in any analysis course or in any topology course, proving that these properties are preserved under continuous maps. Today, we want to um, look at curves from a different point of view. We look at a subset of X. We start with the subset of X. And the question is, when is it really a curve? And uh, the answer will be that other than these two conditions, which are necessary because of this, um, a condition of one dimen dimensionality that we will make precise soon is sufficient to imply that E is in fact an image of a rectifiable curve. And uh, the rectifiability in the sense that uh, this variation, total variation, the supremum over the sum of distances of Ti plus one gamma Ti over all partitions of the curve uh, is finite. So that will be the punchline of the video. And uh, philosophically, this is really interesting because these properties listed here are all intrinsic, as we will see. Uh, you look at the set and decide if it's compact, if it's connected, and this condition also will be intrinsic. And uh, whereas the original definition of a curve is by its very construction, an extrinsic concept, because you parameterize a, a, a subset from a subset of the Euclidean R1. So the question here is, when do these intrinsic properties imply that there is an extrinsic parameterization of this set? First, let's see that uh, obviously some sort of one dimensionality assumption is necessary. Uh, the unit square in R2 is compact, it is connected, but it is not image of a rectifiable curve. Although we saw that it is a, an image of a continuous curve, the so-called space filling or Peana curves. All of these have been discussed in previous videos, uh, specifically the one where, where we started talking about the length and rectifiability. So what is this one dimensionality condition that we're talking about? We will have a subset of an arbitrary metric space. To define its one dimensional Hausdorff measure, First, we define an auxiliary object, which is called the Hausdorff content. So for some delta positive fixed, we define H1 delta of this set to be this infimum, infimum of summation of diameters. And the infimum is over all coverings of your set with uh, subsets of diameter at most delta. This is not a... Um, this is not an object that you can absorb in just uh, 30 seconds of um, description. And uh, if you haven't seen these before, if you're not that familiar with this object, I uh, 
recommend you watch my videos on the host of measure, especially the motivational one. It's one of the best uh, watched videos on, on my channel. And that goes over all details of why this is defined that way. Why on earth um, does this have to do with the length of a curve and uh, many, many other intricate things that I don't wanna get into. That's just a black hole. Um, then the object we want is actually this one, which is the Hausdorff measure. And that is when we let Delta go to zero. This is um, in Delta, this is a non-increasing function. So when you go backward this way, the, the limit here exists, which could be infinity. Letting this delta go to zero is important because uh, it makes this H1 an outer regular Borel measure. It's, it's a nice measure on any metric space. It doesn't have to be Euclidean. H1 agrees with the length of intervals on R1. So H1 of A to B is just B minus A. If the interval is infinite, uh, we get infinity. If the infinite misses, if the interval misses the endpoints, it doesn't matter. Um, if you apply H1 to other subsets of H uh, R1, it coincides with the Lebesgue measure. Um, it actually coincides with the Lebesgue outer measure, so you can apply it to even non-measurable subsets of R1. And uh, H1 of countable sets is zero because H1 of the one point is zero, all nice exercises. Um, but this is pretty much all the properties of the Hausdorff one measure that we will need. Okay, let's uh, first give this theorem which tells that H1 in fact continues to agree with the notion of length in, in much broader generality. If you have a continuous and injective uh, curve in Euclidean space, then the length, this variation defined through this summation agrees with the H1 of the image of the curve. And notice here, we only have continuous assumption and not Lipschitz. Um, so therefore we actually have this corollary that says a curve that is continuous and injective will be rectifiable if and only if it has finite H1 measure. Um, remember that uh, this curve does not have to be Lipschitz. The counter function and its graph uh, is an example of a continuous curve with finite length, but the parameterization as it is, is not a Lipschitz one. We can re-parameterize it to be Lipschitz, but um, the original fun curve is not Lipschitz. So the necessity of injectivity is uh, seen from the fact that H1 is defined for a subset and it does not see any reparameterization and it also doesn't see overlaps. So if you tra tra travel the circle twice or 10 times, H1 doesn't see that. H1 only sees the, the image, the set. Length, on the other hand, sees the, the parameterization. Is it from zero to two pi, or is it from zero to 10 pi? Um, in computation of length, it, it matters, but with H1, it won't matter. So that's why injectivity is sort of necessary. And remember, we had the formula for the length, the speed formula. If you are now Lipschitz and injective, then well, if you are just Lipschitz, we know that this quantity here equals L1, I mean, L of gamma. And uh, because it is injective from the theorem above, we see that these are, these are equal, therefore we get this equality. And uh, my next video will go over a generalization of this, not only for non-injective, but also for maps that go into uh, metric spaces. Already, this theorem is true for metric space targets, but its proof is not trivial. The proof in Leone's book is uh, dependent on, our, on, on the structure of the Euclidean space. 
maybe there could be some alternative proof avoiding that, but per se, the proofs depend on the Euclidean structure. So I didn't wanna uh, give this theorem in, in the metric setting. But anyway, that this says we can recover the H1 measure of the, the image of a curve by integrating its speed. This is an intrinsic uh, object. And uh, on the other hand, we have the parameterization. So back to the question of, we look at a set and when is it the image of a curve? Um, we start by recalling the notion of path connectedness. We say a set is path connected if any of its points can be joined by a continuous curve within E. Um, the, this set is not path connected because, because it is not even connected. And I will give you an example of, um, an example showing that, well, connect, path connected implies that the set is connected but uh, it's strict. So some connected sets are not path connected. We will see an example in a moment. So why is this important? Because if a set is going to be the image of a curve, it must be path connected. So again, path connectedness is an intrinsic topological property. And because images of curves are path connected, if E is going to be image of a curve, it has to be path connected. So previously we had seen that images of curves are connected and compact, uh, but also we can add to the list that they are path connected. So also the notation, not the notation, the terminology continua will be used uh, just to say that a set is compact and connected. So if, it's, if any subset of a metric space or all of that metric space is compact and connected, we call it a continuum. A continuum and in their plural is continua. Okay, the important theorem here is that if you are compact and connected and the H1 measure of your set is finite, then you are path connected. This theorem in the first glance to me personally, wasn't that the first thing I, I, I thought was, well, isn't compact and connected AB always path connected? So is, is this a trivial thing? Then there is this counter example. So you have the sine curve uh, and let's say you start at a finite truncation Okay, and then here's the sine curve, which gets denser and denser. Okay, and then you add to it the closure. So you go and add this limiting set. So which is plus one, negative one on the y-axis. So our set of interest is the union of the blue and red. The point is that this set is compact because it's bounded and closed. It is connected, needs some um, thinking, it's an exercise, but it is not path connected, again, an exercise. So the connectedness is that you cannot separate the set using two uh, different open sets. So we cannot separate this set into uni by, by two open sets that have no intersection. There is just no point where you can cut them open. The red, if you put any, any open yellow around the red, it also picks some from blue. And because blue cannot be broken, that must contain all of this set. So that's proof of connectivity, but there isn't a single path that joins any point on the blue part to any point on the red part. 
If you wanna read more about these creatures and variants, uh, see this article on Wikipedia. So here is an obvious counter example to the, to the possible claim that connected and compact implies path connected. Um, so that's why the theorem is interesting that having finite H1 measure uh, plus those implies path connected. It, it's kind of surprising result to me. I, I don't exactly see how finiteness of this H1 measure has anything to do with path connectivity. Um, it hasn't really settled down in, in my intuition. Okay. This uh, result is a positive step towards saying that certain sets are images of curves because path connectedness was necessary and now we have it. So, okay. <clears throat> yeah, the most important theorem of today is that the conditions we just saw were are actually sufficient. We don't need to impose any more. If you are connected and compact and with finite H1, we saw that the issue of path connectedness is fine, that checks. But now the much stronger claim is that in fact, then you can parameterize this space by a Lipschitz curve. And there's more about it that almost every point is covered twice, exactly twice. The length of the curve is twice the Hausdorff on measure of X. Um, surjectivity, quite like natural. Closed here means that gamma of A equals gamma of B. Now this needs some pictures, to be honest. Why two? Okay, so here is a very simple picture. Suppose you have this and endpoints are included. So this is compact. So it's and connected. So this is a continuum. And Hustorf one measure of this is finite uh, because Hustorf one measure agrees with any natural notion of length. So this will be just add the length of these three segments. Now, if you, if you run a curve, if you want to parameterize this curve, I mean, this set with a curve, that means you want to ha ha map from A, B into this and cover it. So let's say you start at this end point and then you travel this way. Now, when you reach here, you have to decide on one of the branches. So let's say you continue this way. Then to cover the other branch, you have to make that travel backward so that you can reach this point and then, then take that point. So here you save some overlap by covering this and this only once, but here you have to cover twice. And you can make the situation as worse as you, you wish by having like so many different branches. So here, if you parameterize, uh, by a curve, then you can save only one segment. You can travel this one once, but every other one of them, you have to travel twice because you go up and then to be able to cover the other ones, you have to return. So every one of them will be covered twice. So basically you are forced to accept overlaps. Uh, the theorem requires the curve to be closed. I don't see any real benefit of having a closed one, I'd rather uh, see covering just once. But anyway, closeness is that you also want to return to this beginning point. So when you finish parameterizing these and you are back at this point, you have to return. So then you cover everything. And notice that in these examples, this one point in the middle is covered more than twice, but that's only one point and that has zero master of measure. So the theorem says that only claims that H1 almost every point. So the points where you cover uh, more than twice will be places, will constitute only a set of zero H1 measure, which could still be uncountable. Um, uh, 
unless you conjecture and prove that it's even a smaller set of points. Okay, that, that about overlaps. And then about this wishing to cover by only um, injective curves, basically. What you can do is that your space X is union of curves, which and plus some, some other, uh, well, let's say, dust set, a counter set, let's say, such that each gamma i is image of a Lipschitz injective curve. So in this way, you what you get is that you, this goes into the dust set, and then the remaining part is, well, gamma one here, gamma two, gamma three and gamma four and gamma five. So each one of these parts is image of one injective Lipschitz curve. And then uh, their union plus some dust where, well, with dust, we mean that H one of C is zero, uh, recover your X. This is actually another theorem in uh, Leone's book. It's stated for Euclidean targets, but it works, I, I think, for metric targets as well. So I didn't want, want to state this theorem separately uh, because for metric spaces, we would need some probably adjustments. But anyway, these are close relatives. And uh, if you hate covering twice, then you can do this. So it's countable union of images of injective Lipschitz curves plus some set with H1 measure zero. But anyway, let's go back to the main uh, fact here that if you are compact and connected and your H1 measure is finite, then you, all of your set is contained in the image of a Lipschitz curve. And this has important corollaries, uh, one of them being that they are rectifiable sets and the rectifiable sets by definition are those that can be covered by countably many images of uh, Lipschitz maps from subsets of R1. So this is like one rectifiable, but uh, we have any number rectifiable. K rectifiable will be a, a metric space that can be covered by images of Lipschitz maps from RK. And this notion of rectifiability is very important in geometric measure theory. So knowing that a set is rectifiable is a big deal. And this theorem is uh, such a theorem. If you are compact and connected and with finite H1, then you are rectifiable. And uh, this becomes even more interesting if you know, happen to know that there are some sets which are called purely unrectifiable, in this case, one unrectifiable. And that means though you cannot cover any part of these sets with uh, images of Lipschitz maps unless they have H1 measure zero. So no significant parts of these sets can be visible to images of Lipschitz maps. Although they may have H1 positive, they may be one dimensional and looking. Corollary number two is that if you are actually in Euclidean space, then because your function is Lipschitz, it has a derivative by Rademacher's theorem. And the derivative is a vector which gives you uh, the tangent to the set. Let me again here draw a picture. So here is a continuum with finite H1. Then the corollary said that, says that at almost every point, there is a well-defined notion of tangent line. So here, there's this tangent. The points where there isn't a tangent are here, 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 and here, and here, the breaks. But then the, the theorem says that uh, those constitute only a set of zero H1 measure. And this is interesting. So uh, 
let's remove all the intermediate uh, facts here and just read this claim. If you are compact and connected with H1 measure, then you have, you can have these breaks only at a set of zero H1 measure. There isn't an immediate way, intuitive way at least, to me or personally speaking, uh, to see why not. What is preventing you from having so many breaks more than on a set of zero H1 measure? Another exercise would be that build, build one such set with uncountably many breaks. And I think I know the answer to that. If you have been following the videos, it should be contained in some of them. Okay, yeah, so that's the promised intrinsic characterization of curves. Connected compact with finite H1. And I wanna finish with some uh, clarification that these theorems hold when for sets where H1 is finite. And this is a stronger claim than saying that your set is Hausdorff one-dimensional. In the previous examples um, and theorems, the sets we have are one-dimensional, but being one-dimensional does not always imply this. And the counter example is here. So you have a counter set, it's uncountable, but it has zero dimension, zero Hausdorff dimension, and then you multiply it by unit interval. And there are some theorems that tell you that the Hausdorff dimension of uh, this will be one, okay? So now this is a subset of R2 with Hausdorff dimension equal to one, but not only it is, it has H1 finite, I mean infinite, it is even not equal to a union of countably many with H1 of each being finite, which, is, which means that X is, does not have H1 finite measure and it is not sigma finite either. It's not a countable union of subsets, each being finite. For example, R, all of R, does not have finite H1, but it is union of pieces, for example, negative n to positive n, n being natural number, and each one of these has finite h1. So it's still close to being finite h1. So if we work in pieces, we can recover some of the result. But this uh, counter set example shows us that just one dimensionality is far from giving us any of the previous results. Uh, well, that set was not connected but that can be fixed. So by adding, say, the x-axis, like a com, that becomes a com. Um, this then, if you are finite, this becomes compact connected, but this is not finite. And uh, you can, this becomes an interesting exercise to show that uh, you cannot cover all of this set by one Lipschitz curve by one single Lipschitz curve. And that, that's a nice exercise, by the way. Um, you have to prove that you can pick up at most countably many of these, but we have uncountably many. So no matter how hard the Lipschitz curve tries, it will only pick uh, countably many of them. And, and here is my, my claim that even if you allow infinite interval of parameterization, if this into R2, okay, is Lipschitz, then image of this cannot cover six. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, so next video will be on one dimensional area formula. I'm glad I finished just before my cuffs came back from a flu I had. I'll see you in that video. Please uh, do comment and uh, uh, ask questions if you have any. Thank you and have a great time.